So what we just realized is that even a point particle, a point particle that can't even rotate because it has no physical extent, and it's just moving in a straight line, it can still have angular momentum. And that's just the extreme case. What I'm about to show you, what we've been calculating, applies to any object. It can have a size, it could be spinning, it could be a disk. But the point is, this is extreme case. In general, any object translating along can have angular momentum. So let's calculate what it would be for that disk in the problem that we're slowly working on here. So here is a coordinate system here. And let's think about the disk in three positions. Here, here, and here. And it's moving along at V for each one. No forces, no torques, just gliding along at V. We'll call this position one, this position two, this position three, and the positions one and three are at minus D and D on this axis, could be the x-axis. And the height above the origin we'll call H. All right, so what we're gonna do is calculate the angular momentum at each position, see what we get. Position one, L. We said it's R cross P. So we gotta get those vectors. So R is just the position vector. Go from the origin to where it sits. There's R1. For this problem, I'd recommend putting an angle uh, there. There's theta, okay? So the way we'll do it is we'll go with the uh, magnitude way, right? The magnitude of R times the magnitude of P times the sine of the angle between them. The magnitude of R1 in this case is, it's a right triangle, all right? So there's uh, H, D, right triangle, Pythagorean theorem, the square root of H squared plus D squared. There's R. The magnitude of P is just MV. We just bring the M in front of the V there, and that's the momentum, MV. And then it's supposed to be sine of the angle between them. It is sine of the angle between them, but I don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking, well, it's the sine of the angle I was given, or the sine of the angle that was obvious to me, or the sine of the angle that's right there. Remember, for a cross product, it's the sine of the angle as you go from the first vector to the second vector. So this was R1, and this was P, so it's that angle that we want. We call that phi. We want the sine of phi, not the sine of theta. Okay, so I'm gonna put phi here. Well, that's okay, but we could also write that as uh, the sine of what? We could say it's 180 minus theta, right? 180, take away theta, that's what phi is. So we could replace this with a sine of 180 minus theta. But guess what the sine of 180 minus theta is? Sine of theta. Oh, because sine is symmetric that way. Sine theta. So you can just call this one sine theta, but it's a coincidence, okay? If I had put theta over here, it would have been something else. In general, always be careful to use the angle between the two vectors like that. So if we keep going then, we say this is a square root of h squared plus d squared times m times v. And now we need the sine of theta. And the reason I like to put it there is because then it's easy to get. It's opposite over hypotenuse. So we say h opposite over hypotenuse square root of h squared plus d squared. Thank God that's gonna go away. Okay. So that goes away and we get um, I'm going to write it in the order HMV, the height times the mass times the velocity, because that looks like RP. That's the distance you care about, MV. So that's the answer. That is the angular momentum at position one. Okay. Let's do position two. All right, so we'll go a little quicker. L equals R cross P. Uh, let's see. Now, this time R straight up. R2, P, MV, straight that way. So right here, we're at 90 degrees, you can see. If I bring this tail to tail with that, the angle's 90 degrees. So uh, I got ahead of myself, I'm sorry. So the magnitude of R is H. There's no angle here, it's just straight up, H. The magnitude of P is MV. The sine of the angle between them is the sine of 90 degrees. You can tell just by looking at it. Sine of 90 degrees is one, right? So this one is just HMV. Interesting, same thing at position two. Okay. Now let's finish it off. Let's do position three. L equals R cross P. What's it gonna be? Let's draw some vectors here. There's 
R3, right? And there's P is MV. Uh, we could also go with that as theta this time. And now we see that is the angle between them, right? R, it's gonna be the same thing. R is a square root of H squared plus D squared. H squared plus D squared. P is MV. And uh, the sine, of in this case, <coughs> it really is this theta. Because we bring this vector up here, draw them tail to tail. I'll go ahead and draw them. Right, there's R3, there's P. It is theta. So we'll put sine of theta. And now a similar thing is going to happen. Square root of H squared plus D squared. Surely that's not in the answer. MV. What's the sign of that angle? H over the hypotenuse, opposite over hypotenuse of H over, what's the hypotenuse? Square root of H squared plus D squared, HMV. So at all three positions, it has the same angular momentum. So a point particle or just a mass, it's not rotating, moving in a straight line, can have angular momentum L, and it is constant for an isolated system, of course. If you had a force on it, it might not be. So not only can we define angular momentum this way, it seems to follow the rules. It seems to be conserved for something just moving along and not being pushed.